Good evening. My name is Ray Halls, and I'm on the staff here at the Church History Museum. And I extend a warm welcome to all of you joining us for this Facebook Live event. Tonight's presentation by Elder Kyle S. McKay is part of our Evenings at the Museum program. Unfortunately, because of the coronavirus shutdown, the Church History Museum is still closed to the public as of today, Thursday, September 24th, 2020. But please continue to watch our website for the latest news about reopening dates. In the meantime, we'll continue to hold virtual events to help you stay connected to us and to the history of the church. For example, as we get ready to vote in the upcoming election, watch for a museum Facebook presentation about the first female state senator in the country who was elected right here in Utah. And as we approach the holiday season, join us for a look at Utah's first Thanksgiving when we explore the hardships and faith of the early Latter-day Saints and their first year in Utah. So check our Facebook page frequently for dates for these and other future programs. Tonight, we are very grateful to have Elder Kyle S. McKay with us to speak on the topic of Joseph Smith's first vision. Elder McKay is very involved in the Church History Museum because he serves as the Assistant Executive Director of the Church History Department. In addition to this assignment, he is serving as a counselor in the North America Southwest Area Presidency. He practiced law for over 30 years before being called as a General Authority 70 in 2018. He's not only busy at work and at church, he's also busy at home, where he and his wife Jennifer are the parents of nine children. Thank you, Elder McKay for being here with us tonight, and we'll turn the balance of the time over to you. Thank you, Brother Halls. I am honored to be invited to be part of this evening with you. I uh, regret, I lament the fact that we are not together in person, but this is our world for a season, and so we're doing this thing electronically because we are not together in person. I pray that the blessing and the promise that Lehi gave his son Jacob might be in full force and effect tonight. To Jacob, Lehi said, Thou hast beheld in thy youth his glory. Wherefore thou art blessed, even as they unto whom he shall minister in the flesh. For the spirit is the same yesterday today and forever. And so tonight, although you and I are not able to minister to each other in the flesh, I pray that the Spirit will make it as though we had. At the outset, I feel it's important for you to understand a couple of things regarding the position from which I come as I talk about the first vision and some of the things I've learned from it. First, I'm a believer. Many of my PhD brilliant friends in the church history department have explained to me that when historians review or research an artifact or an event, they must do so dispassionately, bringing no preconceived ideas with them, and then simply follow the evidence wherever it may lead. I am not dispassionate about the first vision because although it is a matter of history, like everything else that has ever happened, including today's lunch, the first vision, its significance, its meaning, its reality, the first vision is more than just history. It constitutes what Paul called the things of God. And the things of God are most often foolishness unto men, because the things of God can be understood only by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. 
Tonight I pray that we might deepen our understanding of the deep things of God as we review this sacred event that happened. We know that by the power of the Holy Ghost we may know the truth of all things. And by that same power, we can know the meaning of all truth. And so, as we discuss the first vision, I pray that the Holy Ghost will be with us and impart to us both truth and meaning. Something else you ought to understand regarding my position in this matter is that my primary purpose tonight is not to offer a rebuttal or a refute or a response even to our critics and the arguments that they throw up against the first vision. Now, having said that, much of what I say tonight will do just that because, candidly, I have many of the same questions that they have had. We come to different conclusions, the critics and I, mainly because we start from different places. I take as my pattern the boy Joseph, who entered the grove and asked God with unwavering faith. If you would have knowledge of the deep things of God from God, then you must ask God with unwavering faith. You must move beyond or set aside doubt and skepticism. You must move beyond even the ambivalence of mere curiosity to a point where you can exercise at least a particle of belief or a particle of faith, a desire to believe. And as you exercise that faith, and as that faith becomes more and more certain, even unwavering, then God can and will answer. Now, some of the things that the critics bring up, in fact, all of them, for the most part, can fall into two different categories. Number one, the timing of Joseph's recording of the first vision. Why did it take so long if it was such a significant event? And number two, the, the differences, the various discrepancies, maybe even some errors in one or two of the accounts. I've had those questions, and so I will address them. The first, the timing, I'll address up front. The second, the various versions, the differences and discrepancies, I'll address more near the end. So let me ask you, if you saw God the Father and his son Jesus Christ in a secluded grove, would you write about it? I would. Would you wait 12 or 18 years to write about it? I wouldn't. And I don't think you would either. Do you know why? Well, here's one reason. You don't have to go into debt to buy a pen and paper. Joseph had to go into debt. He borrowed money to buy a quill and a little bottle of ink during the translation of the Book of Mormon. Your world is not Joseph's world. Moreover, his world, his tradition, both in his family and in the time, was not one of making a history a recorded history, and so he didn't. Think of all the things that happened in Joseph's life that we know about that were both dramatic and traumatic, and he never wrote about them. He never wrote about his seven-year-old experience, almost losing, losing his leg, almost losing his life. He didn't write about the first vision. He didn't write about the death of Alvin. He didn't write about the visitation of Moroni and other heavenly messengers. He wrote nothing about his courtship with and marriage to Emma. He did not write about the birth of his children. He did not write about the death of his children. He wrote nothing historical until the Lord commanded, there shall be a record kept among you. And even then, it took him two years to start obeying that commandment. Joseph simply did not write. The fairer question would be, why didn't Joseph write anything? And in context of his time, it becomes clear. 
Finally, Joseph didn't write because he was likely hesitant to write. He, as well as Emma, understood his lack of writing capacity. You'll remember that Emma observed he couldn't put together three sentences, coherent sentences, and yet he translated this marvelous book of Mormon. Well, Joseph was even more keenly aware of his weakness in writing than Emma was. In a letter written to W.W. Phelps in uh, November of 1832, this would have probably been right after his first attempt at writing his history, including the first vision. He made this lamentation, O Lord God, Deliver us in thy due time from the little narrow prison of paper, pen, and ink, and a crooked, broken, scattered, and imperfect language. Joseph simply didn't have words. He didn't have capacity to communicate what happened to him in the grove in the spring of 1820, and neither do you. It surpasses comprehension and expression. So he may have been reluctant in that respect as well. But fortunately, he did write. He did record. We have four accounts that Joseph himself recorded or dictated to others. We will explore those tonight. We will also uh, add or augment them by accounts written by others who had heard Joseph retell his account and then made their own accounts. Orson Pratt, for example, a, a German convert named Alexander Neibauer a reporter from the Pittsburgh Weekly Gazette named David Nye White, and there are others, Orson Hyde, um, basically uh, copied much of Orson Pratt's. He created his own version, and there were others. We'll borrow from those, but spend most of our time talking about the four accounts that Joseph made. And of those four, uh, it just so happens that most of the questions and discussions arise from the first two, the 1832 and the 1838 account. But the first reference, the first record we have of the first vision was made by the Lord himself, dictated by him into a revelation that was probably recorded, or at least it began, uh, it had its beginnings in 1829. It was officially recognized on the day the church was established, April 6th, 1830. Almost in passing, the Lord says, after it was truly manifested unto this first elder that he had received a remission of his sins, he was entangled again in the vanities of the world. There you have it. That highlighted portion there, that prepositional phrase, that adverbial clause that really just modifies the sentence that is to come, that is God's reference to the first vision. I think it is instructive how God characterizes that event. It was personal to Joseph, and God recognizes it. It was a quest by Joseph, a young boy, to receive forgiveness of his sins and to seek salvation. That is the first record we have or reference that I know of to the first vision. So let's turn now to the 1832 account it was written by Joseph and his scribe, Frederick G. Williams. But the actual first vision itself is in Joseph's handwriting. It is personal and autobiographical and reflective. It's written about the summer of 1832, and it focuses on his personal yearnings for forgiveness and salvation and his struggles to understand how he could be forgiven. It may have been influenced both in content and in style by an event that took place earlier in that summer. Joseph and Sidney Rigdon and Newell K. Whitner, Whitney traveled to Missouri, and on their way back, they had an accident. Newell K. Whitney was injured. Joseph sent Sidney on to Kirtland, and he stayed in Greenville, Indiana, to uh, convalesce with Newell K. Whitney or to comfort him and minister to him while he convalesced. That was a difficult time for Joseph. He wrote a letter to Emma on June 6, 1832, and in it expressed some melancholy and also shared this account. 
I have visited a grove which is just back of the town almost every day where I can be secluded from the eyes of any mortal and there give vent to all the feelings of my heart in meditation and prayer. I have called to mind all the past moments of my life and am left to mourn and shed tears of sorrow for my folly in suffering the adversary of my soul to have so much power over me as he has had in times past. But God is merciful and has forgiven my sins. And I rejoice that he sendeth forth the comforter unto as many as believe and humbleth themselves before him. What a sweet experience and what a sweet insight to his soul and to his practices, his patterns. Here is a young man, 26 years of age, who evidently, since the time he first entered the grove, has continued to find secluded circumstances to seek forgiveness from God, where possible, it seems, a grove. This pattern is consistent throughout his life. In several sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, usually toward the beginning, the Lord makes this declaration, thy sins are forgiven thee. In the 90th section, he says, according to thy petition. Now, if you'll read the Doctrine and Covenants and pay attention to all the places, this is just a sampling, this is not exhaustive, but here are sections where the Lord also says, thy sins are forgiven thee. He does not add the tag, according to thy petition, but it can be inferred because of this doctrine. And by the way, throughout this little discussion tonight, uh, one of my purposes is to pause periodically and identify how the first vision fits into and sheds light on God's doctrine and God's dealings with man. And so here's the first one. God does not foist forgiveness on anyone. He mercifully grants it in response to our earnest pleas, our earnest requests for forgiveness. So in all of these sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, where the Lord says, thy sins are forgiven thee, it is safe to infer a request on Joseph's, on Joseph's part for forgiveness. He lived a lifetime of repentance and forgiveness. He was the embodiment of these scriptures that he translated as oft as they repented and sought forgiveness with real intent, they were forgiven. I cannot help as I think of Joseph's life of repentance and forgiveness. I cannot help but think of our current prophet who preached to us recently, nothing is more liberating, more ennobling, or more crucial to our individual progression than is a regular daily focus on repentance. Repentance is not an event, it is a process. There is a comforting connection and continuity between these two great prophets. I take comfort in the fact, for example, that the first prophet of this dispensation lived what the current prophet of this dispensation preaches. And of course, so does President Nelson. The 1832 account, let's dive into it. He expressed concern for his personal salvation, saying that from about the ages 12 to 15, he wrestled with this. This age identification may be off by a year. If the, if the year period is three to four years, then it could have easily been 11 to 14 instead of 12 to 15 because we know that his first vision took place when he was 14. He communicates that he was distressed in mind for his own sins and for the sins of the world and uh, recognizing that the world may be and was in apostasy. He said he was convicted of his own sins. This is one thing, by the way, that is consistent throughout all of his accounts. He was troubled. He wanted freedom from sin. He wanted forgiveness. He wanted salvation. And how to get it, he did not know. He did know this, that there was a God. And he knew it and expressed it through some pretty beautiful language, if you read the account. For a guy who couldn't write very well, 
He writes a beautiful, flowery description of nature, including the beasts and the creation and man, and how all of this helped him to understand that there truly is a God. He also knew and trusted in the scriptures. He said that the event, the first vision, happened in the 16th year of my age, or in other words, when he was 15. All the other accounts who mention age specifically put him at 14 years of age, which, and that includes the 1838 account, which is now scripture. So he was 14. The simple explanation for this, he got it wrong. I'm okay with that. We'll learn later on how it's easy to get things off by a little bit. This is a non-material error regarding a non-material fact. So because he was in his 15th year or 14 at the time of the first vision, then his concern for salvation may have been from ages 11 to 14. When Christ, when the Father and the Son appear, they, Christ testifies of himself and says, none doeth good, they draw near to me with their lips while their hearts are far from me. Now this is important because the 1832 edition has as its main focus Joseph's pursuit for personal forgiveness, personal salvation. But here is evidence that there was a conversation regarding the creeds of the day. And here it is. None doeth good. They draw near to me with their lips while their hearts are far from me. I think it's important to just note that tie to the question, which church is right? Later on in the, in the 1838 version, that seems to be almost exclusively about which church is right, will identify some phrases that make it clear he was concerned about his personal salvation. Then he makes this statement when he talks about the appearance of God and his son. The Lord opened the heavens upon me, and I saw the Lord. Now that has given some a moment's pause, and candidly, I paused as well. Is he talking about just one person? Did, did the Lord open the heavens and then the Lord appeared to him? Or were there two beings? Well, we know that there were two beings, and the, uh, the question is, well, what is the meaning of this? It's not an outlier. I have come to learn as I've studied the other accounts. In fact, this language actually helps us to understand language in some of the other accounts. And it helps us to understand the dealings of God with his children. In the 1835 account, and in another account, the David Nye White account that we'll reference in a minute, Joseph said, a personage appeared in the midst of this pillar of flame Note he says flame and not light. Sometimes he had a hard time deciding what word to use. Then another personage soon appeared like unto the first. He said unto me, thy sins are forgiven thee. David Nye White, the reporter of the Pittsburgh Weekly Gazette, recalled this and wrote it. And now this is from an interview with Joseph in August of 1843. He's recording it now in September of 43. I directly saw a light and then a glorious personage in the light and then another personage. And the first personage said to the second, behold, my beloved son, hear him. Joseph's first account in 1832 helps me understand these other two accounts and also God's dealing, dealings with his children. John Alger was a young boy who heard Joseph recount his experience in the grove, and then later on in life, much later on, bore testimony of it. In that meeting was a man named Charles Walker who recorded it in his diary. Now I understand that in a court of law, this would be inadmissible. It's just too much removed. But it's instructive, and I think that it is consistent with the other accounts. John Alger heard Joseph, quote, relate his vision of seeing the father and the son that God touched his eyes with his finger and said, Joseph, this is my beloved son, hear him. As soon as the Lord had touched his eyes with his finger, he immediately saw the Savior. And so that first uh, 1832 account where the Lord opened the heavens upon me and I saw the Lord, it is easily read, the Lord God opened the heavens upon me and I saw 
the Lord Jesus. This is consistent with other experiences Joseph had in uh, the 76th section, the revelation it was called. He and Sidney had this experience. While we meditated upon these things, the Lord touched the eyes of our understandings and they were opened. And the glory of the Lord shone round about and we beheld the glory of the Son on the right hand of the Father and received of his fullness. So here is the Lord revealing, the Lord God revealing the Lord Jesus, his son, to the prophet Joseph. This is consistent, by the way. Maybe we'll, we'll look at one more um, in the 110th section in the Kirtland Temple. Similar experience. The veil was taken from our minds and the eyes of our understanding were open. We saw the Lord. Who, who took the veil from their minds? Who, who opened the eyes of their understanding? Well, God did. God the Father either personally or under his direction. It is consistent with his doctrine now. We'll shift from dealings to doctrine, where the Lord uh, testifies and reveals the Father, and the Father testifies and reveals the Son. In, the, in 3 Nephi 11.32, Jesus says, I bear witness of the Father, and the Father beareth witness of me, and the Holy Ghost beareth witness of the Father and me. And we learn from other scriptures in Matthew 11:27 and also Luke 10:22 that not only do they testify of each other but they reveal each other if we are to understand those scriptures correctly. And so in this case the Lord God revealed the Lord Jesus as he had done and testified of him during his at his baptism on the mount of Transfiguration, and then of course he showed him, revealed him unto the Nephites at the Bountiful Temple after his resurrection. This is consistent between the various accounts and also with his doctrine and dealings. The 1835 account, and by the way, I, I'm, I apologize if I'm moving on without addressing some of your favorite parts of any of these accounts. But the 1835 account is uh, an entry in Joseph's journal. The, the 32 account was an attempt at an autobiography of sorts. The 35 account is Joseph's journal. It's written by his scribe, Warren Parrish, and it is capturing <clears throat> a conversation between Joseph Smith and a man named Robert Matthews. He was an, eccent an eccentric religionist of the day, it went by Matthias or Joshua the prophet, a Jewish priest. He came to Joseph having heard of him and asked him to recount some of his experiences, when, and Joseph did. In this account, we are first introduced to his questioning, I knew not who was right or who was wrong. Now he's pondering the creeds and religions of the day and confused about which to join. We're introduced to that idea. We're also here for the first time, and this is Joseph spelling, my tongue seemed to be swollen in my mouth. This is his battle with darkness. Uh, Alexander uh, Nybauer describes it as his tongue was cleft to the roof of his mouth. And you can almost, you can do that on your own. It's just stuck hard there, almost in seizure-like fashion. It helps bring the thing uh, close to home and make it understandable. We also learn about this noise behind him, like some person walking towards me, he said. The noise of walking seemed to draw nearer. I sprung up on my feet and looked around but saw no person or thing. He makes this statement, light appeared, rested upon him, and it filled me, he said, with joy unspeakable. In the 1835 and 1832 accounts, the Holy Ghost is prominent. In the 1832 account, he says how he walked around for days, filled with love and joy, and here he is again with the fruits of the Spirit, presence of the Spirit, filled with joy unspeakable. Here's this statement that we've already read. A personage appeared, and then another, like unto the first, and said unto me, Thy sins are forgiven thee. Remember again, here comes one first, and then another. If you will notice in our current depiction of the first vision that we have here in the Church History Museum, it's depicted that way. It's subtle, but it is depicted that way. And again, Thy sins are forgiven thee. That is the focus of this account as well, even though we do 
understand that he was struggling to understand which church was right. And I saw many angels in this vision. I'm going to return to that statement. About 15, uh, 14 years old, uh, like I said, wherever age is mentioned specifically, it's 14 years, except the 1832 version, which I think he just got off by a year in his 16th year. I retired to the silent grove and bowed down before the Lord under a realizing sense that he had said, ask and you shall receive, and if you ask wisdom, let him ask of God. We'll talk about this realizing sense, but first this idea, this thought, this report that he saw many angels in this vision. This again points us to God's dealings with his children and just the way things are. In his glorious revelation that we've already referred to, the 76th section, after saying what we've already read and we beheld the glory of the Son on the right hand of the Father, Joseph and Sidney saw the holy angels and them who are sanctified before his throne, worshiping God and the Lamb who worship him forever and ever. This experience is consistent with what Lehi saw. He saw the heavens open, and he thought he saw God sitting upon his throne, surrounded with numberless concourses of angels, in the attitude of singing and praising their God. Alma the Younger, recounting his experience to his son Helaman, had a similar experience. And in fact, he said, I had an experience like Father Lehi, and then he almost used the exact words, quoting verbatim what Lehi said here in the book of Revelations, were also introduced to what the revelators saw that included concourses of angels. The point is, if the heavens are opened to you and you are privileged to see God the Father, it is likely that you will also see numberless concourses of angels. That's simply his dealing. That's the way it is. And Joseph's experience was consistent with that. It's only mentioned in the 35 account, but... It's consistent with every other time that the Father has been revealed. Now, this phrase, realizing sense. He entered the grove with a realizing sense that if he asked, he would receive. The suffix eyes means to make or become. For Joseph then, it became real. It was made real to him that if he asked, God would answer. He entered the grove with a measure of certainty. In fact, it brought him to a place where he had what James called unwavering faith. That is what opened the heavens and summoned the Father and the Son. In his account, recalling what, jo what he had heard Joseph say, Orson Pratt writes, from this promise, he learned that it was the privilege of all men to ask God for wisdom. With the sure and certain expectation of receiving liberally. This was cheering information to him. He now saw that if he inquired of God, there was not only a possibility, but a probability, yea, more a certainty, that he should obtain a knowledge which of all the doctrines was the doctrine of Christ and which of all the churches was the church of Christ. Remember, Joseph has wrestled with this now for three or four years, according to the 1832 account. He wonders why, he wonders how, and he doesn't know. And so this scripture that he reads, this is why in the 1838 account it says, it, it entered with such force, never has anything entered in the heart of man than this did at this time to mine. It entered with great force, and it was part of the building of unwavering faith in him. He got to a point after those three or four years where now, standing in that grove, his faith is unwavering, and with unwavering faith, he takes his axe and buries the blade in the stump of a tree to mark the spot. Long before Joseph's battle, well, not long before, but during the three years before, three or four years before, his battle with darkness 
in the grove. Joseph had already fought and won the battle against darkness and doubt simply to get to the grove with a certainty that if he asked, God would answer. That is unwavering faith. That is also stirring to my soul. In the 1838 account, we read his first attempt or an attempt at creating a history for and of the church. It is written at a time of great persecution. About this time, in fact, Governor Boggs' termination order comes in October of 38. He's going to be in Liberty Jail. There's intense persecution and hardship. Because of that, he's responding to what he calls evil, disposed, and designing persons, and his language is pretty harsh. Now, I recognize it's our scripture, so I'm not apologizing for it all, for it at all. I'm simply observing, as others have, that in condemning the religions of the day, he used words like wrong, abomination, corrupt. We'll see it presented a little differently in the Wentworth letter. This is the first time we learned that he had previously designed to go there. And from the David Nye White account, uh, we learn about the ax in the stump of the tree. Joseph planned to go there, and probably the next day is when he went there. I share this language simply to, uh, to underscore this broken, scattered, imperfect language that he was dealing with. He said, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head above the brightness of the sun, which descended gracefully. That's how it read originally. And then he crossed it out and said, maybe gradually is a better way to describe it until it fell upon me. Well, for me, I will always now, in my mind, include the word gracefully. That light descended gracefully and gradually until it fell upon me. Now we come to what I think is one of the key phrases in the 1838 account that's in our Pearl of Great Price. This is our scripture. He says, how to act. I did not know. That's why he went to the grove. This is the link back to the personal journey, to the quest for salvation, the quest for forgiveness. I know I need it. I just don't know how. In a sense, this is Joseph's, whither shall I go that I may find or prayer. Show me where to go so that I can molten the tools with which I can work out my own salvation with fear and trembling, because I don't know where to go. I don't know how to act. I suspect he had a sense response when he translated 1 Nephi 15, 14, wherefore they shall be brought to the knowledge of their Redeemer and the very points of his doctrine, that they may know how to come unto him and be saved. Joseph did not know how. And so he sought answers. He asked the Lord, hey, if there's a church out there that's preaching the right way, that'll teach me how to do this, show me, and I'll go do it. Well, it turns out there wasn't. Nybauer again gives us this beautiful part, and it shows up in our current film. Joseph wanted to feel and shout like the rest, but could, not, uh, but could feel nothing. That's a tender description. Remember, he's a boy. And he's a boy who's been struggling this since maybe about age 11. This ties it to the personal nature of his quest and his experience, while at the same time, as you know, the 1838 version highlights his quest to find out which church is true. Why did he need to know? Well, so that he could find out how to come unto him and be saved. Moving now to the 1842 account, this is the Wentworth letter. Uh, John Wentworth, who was an editor for the Chicago Democrat, was asking on behalf of one of his friends, uh, 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 Mr. Barstow, um, George Barstow, who was writing a history of New Hampshire. Now, Joseph had some tie to New Hampshire, think infected leg when he was seven years old. 
And so this author wanted to have some input from Joseph. Tell us about your experience. Tell us about the, the rise, progress, persecution, and faith of the Latter-day Saints. Joseph did. It was not published in Mr. Barstow's book. It was not published in John Wentworth's um, magazine or newspaper, but it was published in the Times and Seasons. I'm so grateful he responded, even though it wasn't used at the time by the people it was directed to. It was written for influencers and opinion leaders. It's 1842. They're now enjoying relative peace and joy in the city of Nauvoo the Beautiful, and so uh, the language is toned down a little bit. They told me, he said, that all religious denominations were believing in incorrect doctrines and that none of them was acknowledged of God as his church and kingdom. That's a little different from wrong, corrupt, abomination. But it shows that he, he was open to church public affairs. Here again we see evidence of his unwavering faith. He said, believing the words of God, I had confidence in the declaration of James. And finally, this is where we learn that he received a promise from the Father and the Son that the fullness of the gospel should at some future time be made known unto him. Now, if I could take all of this and bring it present and personal by sharing with you an experience in my life that was foundational, and maybe we can learn from it. In 1979, uh, I was in the MTC preparing to serve a mission in Japan. Early on in that experience, I came to the conclusion that I could not testify the way I was hearing my fellow missionaries testify. I would hear them say things like, I know the church is true, or this one scared me, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, I still am trying to figure out what that means. But all I knew then is that I couldn't say it. And so I was either going to go out and lie for two years, or I was going to go out and fumble for two years. And so it caused me concern, a little bit of the anxiety that Joseph might have been experiencing in my own little world. And so I decided to exercise a particle of faith. I believed Moroni 10, 3 through 5, and I knelt down and said, Heavenly Father, I'm going to read this. And right now I don't know. I can't say that I know, and I need to know. So when I'm done, I expect to know. I expect to be given a witness that is undeniable and unshakable. And I was asking for a visitation. That's where I was. And so I began to read the Book of Mormon. I read it in a three-week period. It had a wonderful experience. And then at the end of three weeks, I finished the Book of Mormon. I will always remember the night that I knelt by my bed to pray for the witness that I desired. I poured out my heart to God. Earlier in the day, I had finished the book and silently prayed, I'll see you tonight. Then that night, I'm kneeling at my bed and pouring out my heart to God, pleading for a witness. And now I have my own battle with a broken, scattered, and imperfect language as I try to describe the feeling that came over me, a feeling that for me can best be described using words like love and joy and comfort and peace and assurance and reassurance. It was overwhelming, and it caused me to weep into my pillow. And I translated it. I viewed its meaning as a prelude to the witness that I was seeking. And so I took great hope in the feeling. I even peeked open my eyes to see if there were some heavenly messenger. There was not. I continued praying and adjusted my expectations and request. Well, if I'm not going to see anybody, maybe you'll send something I can hear, a voice. I'd grown up hearing and learning about the still, small voice. Still and small, yes, but still a voice. We talk about the whisperings of the Spirit. Okay, whisper. 
in a still voice to my ears that this is true, please. I paused to listen. There was no sound. I continued pleading and the feeling persisted. It was beautiful. Finally, I climbed into bed, still bathing in that wonderful feeling, but a little bit confused and disappointed that I hadn't received the witness I thought. That confusion stayed with me for a couple of days until uh, a mission conference, during which the speaker directed the missionaries to turn to the Doctrine and Covenants, section six. I did not. My head was in my hands, my elbows were on my knees. I was contemplating my dilemma. I can't say that I know. But then I heard him read the words. Now. These words were spoken to Oliver Cowdery, but because all things are present before the Lord, I have to believe that even as he spoke them to Oliver, the Lord thought, one day this is going to mean something big to my servant Kyle. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if you desire a further witness, cast your mind upon the night that you cried unto me in your heart, that you might know concerning the truth of these things. Did I not speak peace to your mind concerning the matter? What greater witness can you have than from God? And now behold, Kyle, you have received a witness. As I heard those words read, my head shot up. I reached for my scriptures. I opened up the Doctrine and Covenants and read those words over and over and over again. And as I did, the feelings from the prior night returned to me. And it was as though the Lord were saying to me, you see, Kyle, this is how I talk. This is the voice. This is the language of the spirit, the tongue of angels. So while you're learning Japanese, learn this language. In fact, you need to be more fluent in this language than you are in Japanese. You need to be more fluent in this language than you are in English. Learn this language. That experience was and is to me beautiful and foundational and I continue to build upon it and learn from it. You would think and hope that something so significant in my life would have been recorded. It is. In fact, I have recorded it four times. What a coincidence. The first recording was a contemporaneous recording around the time of the experience. Eleven years later, in 1991, I recorded it again. Thirteen years after that, in 2004, I recorded it again. Fifteen years after that, in 2019, last year, I recorded it again. What you just heard was roughly the 2019 version. Now, I want to share with you the 1979 version. March 9th, it was a Friday. I asked Siri, today I finished the Book of Mormon. It was great to read it again. I learned a lot of new things. I must now gain an even stronger testimony of it so I can better prepare myself for the Lord's work. Then, a few days later, about a week later, now remember, March 9, I finished the Book of Mormon, so it's that night when I have my experience. The 17th, I shall tell or write how I got a stronger testimony of the Book of Mormon. I finished reading it and desired a stronger witness of its truthfulness. I prayed to the Lord and asked him for that witness, thinking to receive some sort of physical manifestation. When I finished my prayer, I felt great and thought that meant that I would for sure receive the witness that I wanted. Well, no voice told me aloud, no angel appeared, nothing physical. I was disappointed and wondered why I felt so good after my prayer and then nothing happened. 
Well, a couple of days went by, then last Sunday, in mission conference, I was referred to Doctrine and Covenants 6, 22 to 23. It was meant just for me. Look it up and read it. I had received a witness that night, a spiritual witness. It was silly of me to think to receive a spiritual testimony from a physical manifestation. The Book of Mormon is true. Now, what I just read is 201 words. The 2019 version is 751 words. Did I embellish in 2019? The 1991 and 2004 versions both contain historical factual errors. In one, I seek to identify it as a MTC devotional. Well, it was a mission conference. That's not a material error. In the other, I sought to identify the speaker that sent me to Doctrine and Covenants 6. I thought it was A. Theodore Tuttle. It wasn't. Elder Tuttle came a little while later. That's reflected in my journal. So do those errors in those two versions and whatever embellishment might appear to some, does that blow up the entire account? Am I making this up? Anyone who listens to this is left to judge for themselves. I will just tell you that it happened. Just as I recorded in 1979, just as I recorded in 2019 on another day, and, and just as I recorded in 91 and 04. On another day, we can have a discussion about factual memory and interpretive memory, but it happened, just as I said. My experience has helped me understand Joseph's experience and his recording of it. And Joseph's experience and his recording of it has lent credibility for me to my experience. So the differences and the discrepancies and even some errors in non-material facts, they simply do not bother me. Now, in conclusion, I'd like to pivot to the applications of this magnificent event. And in fact, I'll focus on only one and probably the most important application of this event. I'll do so initially by borrowing from Steve Harper. I love what he says here. This is part of the podcast we did uh, uh, regarding the first vision. Listen to his words. Today, we say things to each other like, you know, the real significance of the first vision is we learn about the true nature of God. For example, that God and Christ are separate and embodied. That's true. It's important. But so what if God is embodied, if he's not responsive to his teenage children who are in crisis? The real resonance of the first vision today is to know that it's the nature of God to give to those who lack wisdom, to answer those who are in distress. The God that reveals himself to Joseph Smith in the sacred grove is a God who answers teenagers in times of trouble. Our prophet has preached it this way. If Joseph Smith's transcendent experience in the sacred grove teaches us anything, it is that the heavens are open and that God speaks to his children. The prophet Joseph Smith set a pattern for us to follow in resolving our questions. And the prophet Joseph himself said, Reading the experience of others or the revelations given to them can never give us a comprehensive view of our condition and true relation to God. Knowledge of these things can only be obtained by experience in these things. Joseph and others of his time probably thought that the rise of the church in this dispensation began in September of 1823 when Moroni showed up and said, let's get to work, Joseph. That is a reasonable conclusion. 
This experience in 1820 with the boy in the grove was personal to him. That's kind of the way it was treated in the 20th section of the Doctrine and Covenants when the Lord made passing reference to it. This is an individual child's quest for salvation and forgiveness. It is personal, and yet God took that personal experience and placed it at the beginning of the restoration. Why? I don't know all the answers, but I believe that by doing so, God is inviting us. He is taking a child, this child, this 14-year-old child, and placing him in our midst and commanding us, inviting us to become like him with so many words and in so many ways, including the placement of that first vision at the beginning. God is saying to us, you come to me in a secluded place. And with unwavering faith, you ask me for forgiveness. Ask me for truth and light and knowledge. Ask me using the words of your mouth. And if you ask with unwavering faith, I will come to you. I will forgive you. I will give you light and knowledge and truth. That light will descend gradually. And when it rests upon you, you will see. You will know. You will comprehend the Father and the Son. Go and become as that child. I bear witness that what happened to that child was real. I testify that God the Father and his Son appeared to the boy Joseph in the grove. I testify of the Father and the Son. I bear witness that Joseph Smith is the prophet, the first prophet of this dispensation, chosen and raised up by God to restore the fullness of the gospel in this dispensation. I invite you, I bear witness of Joseph's magnificent experience and invite you to go and follow that pattern with the prophets and apostles, both ancient and modern. I raise my voice to testify and prophesy of Jesus Christ, that he was, that he is, and that he is coming. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.